Yeah, no? Can I call this data? Yeah. So the components of prescription management, there are certain fixed parameters, like some of you said there's a body size, you can look at the residual linear function and the peritoneal membrane transport. And then there are some adjustable parameters, like the fill volume, the number of exchanges, what should be the dwell time, whether the patient is on CAPD or is an automated peritoneal dialysis, the concentration of the glucose that you use, and the type of solution. So this would be adjust. You can adjust these parameters. What you cannot adjust, of course, is the patient size, the resolution function, and the type of peritoneal membrane transport characteristic that he or she has. So therefore, the initial prescription is based on the patient's resolution function, patient's body size, and we, because initially you don't know what is you haven't done a peritoneal equilibration test. So you presume that the patient's transport status is average. And generally we do a baseline peritoneal equilibration test about four weeks after we have initiated the patient on peritoneal dialysis. Now, when you have a patient of end stage kidney disease, you generally give full dose of dialysis. But if that individual is near end stage, which means his GFR is say eight to 10, you see end stage, you will say less than six or less than five. So near end stage, you can do something known as incremental dialysis. Now the benefit of doing incremental dialysis, whether it's hemodialysis or whether it's peritoneal dialysis is that you can preserve the residual renal function because the more dialysis that you give, like I showed you in the Spanish studies, the people who were on twice a week hemodialysis, their loss of residual function was much slower as compared to patients who were on three times a week hemodialysis. Similarly, in peritoneal dialysis, if the number of exchanges to start with, if your patient has not reached, remember has not reached total end stage kidney disease, you can start with fewer exchanges and gradually build up. So, some people have suggested that if your patient has a GFR of around 10 ml per minute, you can get away with one exchange per day in some patients. Those with 7 ml per minute do with at least two exchanges per day. Those between five and six, you have to do three exchanges per day. And if it's less than five, you have to do all the four exchanges per day. Keeping in mind that the fill volume is roughly two liters and the body surface area is about 1.73 meters square. Again, these are some of the empiric prescriptions in adults based on the body surface area and the residual renal function prior to the PET or the peritoneal equilibration test. So if your residual renal function is greater than 2 ml per minute and your body surface area is less than 1.4, you can do three exchanges of two liters each. But if on the other hand, your body surface is a large built patient, it is in excess of two, then you'll have to do maybe four exchanges of three liter volumes. This is provided his residual yield function is more than two ml per minute. If on the other hand, the residual yield function is less than two ml, that is almost negligible residual yield function, then you might have to do much more number of exchanges, particularly if the GFR, a BSA is say less than 1.7, you could see that here in one less than 1.7, you could get away doing four exchanges of two liters, but those whose GFR residual renal function is less than two ml, you might have to do four exchanges of 2.5 liters. So depending on the residual renal function and depending on the body surface area, you can decide your initial prescription. So one size does not fit everyone. If you're a large, Size individual, you have to do more number of exchanges, perhaps the volumes may be need to, to be more. But if a small sized individual, you can get away doing lesser exchanges and lesser volume. And if you're if you have some degree of restoration function being there available, you can get away with fewer exchanges. So your initial prescription would depend on the restoration function, the body surface area of the patient. Now let's look at the physiology. So peritoneal membrane is basically a serosal membrane that covers the peritoneal cavity. 
It has a visceral component and it has a parietal component. 80% is visceral, 20% is parietal, and is lined by a mesothelial monolayer. And the area that is equivalent to the body surface area is one to two square meters. And the lymphatic drainage is mainly via the diaphragmatic stomata. And you have these three types of pores in this membrane. One is the ultra small pore, which is also known as the acroporins. Then you have the small pores and you have the large pores. And across these pores, you have removal of solutes and fluid. And you must remember that this membrane can change either acutely or over a prolonged period of time. Now these large pores, which I showed you, were between say 100 to 200 angstroms. They are not very many in number. They transport many macromolecules and they're clefts in the endothelium. These small pores between 40 to 60 angstrom, they are in large numbers. They transport both small solutes and water. There's no sieving there and we'll talk about that later. And these are again clefts in the endothelium. And the ultra pores, which are very small, which are between four to six angstroms, they're again in large numbers, but they transport only water and there is sodium sieving present. And these are known as aquaporin one water channels. Now 50% of the ultra filtration with dextrose comes through the small pores and 50% of the ultra filtration is via the ultra pores. Now there is three processes which occur simultaneously. One is the diffusion, which is based on the concentration gradient. Second is ultrafiltration, which is actually based on osmotic gradient. And then there's some fluid reabsorption done via the lymphatics. Remember that the diffusion, which is based on the concentration gradient, is maximal in the first hour. And so urea and creatine, they equilibrate the fastest in the first hour. And by four hours of dwell, almost 90, more than 90% of the urea and more than 65% of the creatinine is equilibrated in most individuals. This peritoneal fluid reabsorption, as we talked earlier, it occurs directly via the lymphatics. And there's also absorption in the anterior abdominal wall tissues, which with subsequent removal via lymphatics and capillaries. And this lymphatic reabsorption will reduce your net ultrafiltration. It's difficult to measure, but it's estimated to be about two ml per minute. That is roughly about 600 ml in a five hour dwell. And this lymphatic reabsorption is influenced by intraperitoneal pressure. That is the body size, the dwell volume, the posture, but again, it may vary between individual to individual. Now we were talking about peritoneal equilibration test. And this test actually helps us to assess the peritoneal transport capacity. It's a semi-quantitative test. And it determines the speed of equilibration of the solute concentration between the plasma and the dialysate. And there are basically four classes of these transport characteristic that we know. And uh, this is obtained by adding or subtracting the standard deviation from the mean value. So the PET assesses both the small solute clearance as well as the ultrafiltration. Now, can anyone tell me how does one do the per standard peritoneal equilibration test? Anyone can tell me? How does one do the standard PET? Sir, this standard PET is being done uh, with a 2.5 percent of uh, uh, dextrose solution, uh, and it, it has to be it has to be kept for uh, four hours duration, and uh, uh, with a two two liter bag, and uh, uh, the previous night that, that should uh, uh, be that should not be a dry uh, uh, session. It should okay. have a, a filled up session. In the morning, we have to. Uh, uh, keep the patient in a standing posture and drain the uh, volume which is present in the peritoneal cavity. 
then we'll instill the two liter bag and uh, after that, that should be done in supine posture and after every uh, around uh, 500 ml we have to turn the patient uh, and change the posture and uh, uh, in the beginning we have to uh, uh, we have to collect a sample after mm -hmm. about uh, about uh, we have to remove around uh, 200 ml 100 or 200 ml of fluid uh, and uh, 10 ml should be collected and the rest of the 190 ml has to be re, uh, introduced into the peritoneal cavity and after 2 hours the, uh, similarly we should collect a sample and at the end we have to similarly collect the uh, sample and uh, uh, at the uh, mid session we have to collect a blood sample uh, okay Ex excellent i think uh, excellent so as you mentioned that the patient should not be kept dry this should be an overnight dwell ideally for 8 to 12 hours using a 2.5 percent two liter bag and uh then you drain this fluid out when the patient comes in for this bed in the morning for over at least 20 minutes and you take a new 2.5 liter dextrose bag you warm it up and infuse this over 10 minutes at a rate of 200 ml per minute and after each 400 ml you ask the patient to roll from side to side so that the fluid is spread over the entire peritoneal cavity and this fluid is kept for four hours and while the patient has this fluid in when you're doing the pet you can make him ambulatory during the dwell time and as you rightly mentioned that the first dialysate sample is taken at zero few hours which means as soon as you complete the infusion of the fluid you drain out about 200 ml into the bag and you mix it well and you draw a 10 ml sample of this dialysate and the remaining 190 ml is reinfused back into the peritoneal cavity but it has to be done under total asepsis so that you don't introduce infection you repeat the same procedure at two hours and four hours at four hours you drain out the entire fluid and you measure the amount of fluid in the weight and you take a blood sample, as you rightly mentioned, at two hours, and you measure and you check for glucose, you check for creatinine in all the three, whether it is a blood sample and the three dialysate sample at zero hours, two hours, and four hours. Now, when you do a calculation, you have to check for the correction factor. And this correction factor for creatine, because of the high glucose in the bags, is determined by the individual labs. So what you can do is that you send the sample of fresh solution from a new 2.5% bag, and you measure both glucose and creatine. And divide the creatine value by the glucose value to calculate the corrected creatine factor. So the corrected creatine is actually creatine minus the glucose into the correction factor. So this formula will give you the corrected creatine value. So whatever creatine your lab has measured should ideally be corrected for the glucose, high glucose that you're instilling while doing this test. And in case your correction factor for your lab is not available, this University of Missouri which actually first did this peritoneal incubation test, they have given a correction factor. So this is what this peritoneal incubation graphs look like. You have these creatine values and then you have the glucose values. And I said that this, do you know who designed this peritoneal incubation test and these graphs? Anybody knows the name of the person? Has any, does anybody know who designed this test? Okay, this was done by a person called Twardowski. Twardowski was from the University of Missouri. He was working with Carl Noll. And Twardowski looked at about 800 patients and looked at their peritone characteristics and then designed this test. So as we mentioned that he looked at the median values and then one 
standard deviation above and one stand, two standard deviation above, and similarly one standard deviation below and one sta two standard deviation below. And he gave this terminology that these patients who fall two standard deviations above the average, they, he called them high transporters. Those who are one standard deviation above, he called them high average. And similarly, those who are one standard deviation lower, it was low average, and those who are two standard deviation lower, yeah. transport. Yeah. And then again, he said the same thing for glucose, and he had these things, those who had high transporters, or high average, low average, and low. So mean plus two standard deviation was high, mean plus one standard deviation was high average, mean minus one standard was low average, and mean minus two standard deviation was low. This is for patients when you have this D by P creatinine values. And when you do for D by D zero glucose or by UF volume, again, it's the other way around that mean plus two standard deviation will be low, whereas mean minus two standard deviation will be high. So here you have a patient who's uh, who's say dilated creatinine is 0.9 and zero hours. At two hours it was 5.2, and the D by P ratio was 0 0.56. At four hours it's uh, 0 0.71, and this was a dilated glucose at various times. And again you have these dilated D D uh, with, I mean this is over D by zero values, and you can plot it on this chart graph. And you can then find out what sort of peritoneal membrane characteristic this patient has. And as you can see, the D by P creatinine, when it is charted, it shows that this patient falls in the high average type of membrane characteristic. So it has been seen that almost 90% of the properly conducted PEDs show consistent results in both the ratios. And if there's any discrepancy, if you find that your D by P creatinine is showing something and D by D zero glucose is showing something else, then there is some error either in doing the test or in calculation or estimating these things. So it has to be repeated. Again, if the, there's significantly elevated serum glucose levels, more than 235 milligrams, then you use only the D by P creatinine values to classify the patient. And clinical assessment must be taken into account if results remain discordant. So the high membrane type, the D by P creatinine is ranging in point is above 0.8 to 1. So 0.8 to 1.03. It's a very efficient membrane. It transports solutes quickly. There's a rapid glucose absorption. But these patients have a difficulty in achieving good ultrafiltration. And again, they're at a risk of having low serum albumin. The high average, where the D by P creatinine is between 0.65 to 0.81, it's an efficient membrane. It transports solutes well, and it also ultrafilters well. Those with a low average, where the D by P creatinine ranges between 0.5 to 0.64, the membrane is slightly less efficient as compared to those with high average. It again transports solutes reasonably well, but somewhat slowly, and at ultrafilters well. Those with low type of membrane characteristic, where the D by P creatinine is between 0.34 to 0.49, this is an inefficient membrane. It transports solutes very slowly. And therefore, it is difficult to obtain good clearances. But on the other hand, it ultrafilters very well. So that's the advantage of the low membrane. So if you look at this chart, that it shows the D by P creatinine in patients who are high trans, these are the patients with high transporters, is much better. So the removal of solutes, small solutes particularly, is much better as compared to those with low transport. And if you look at the dilated volume over time, that as time passes, those with high transporters, as I mentioned earlier, have poor ultrafiltration. So their ultrafiltration volume would come down as time as you keep the fluid in the abdomen for longer periods of time. 
This is not the case with those who have low transporters. Low transporters, they ultra filter well. So high transporters, again, the other thing that to remember is that if you have high transporter who has this fluid for a long period of time, although his solute clearance, as I mentioned earlier, is better as compared to low transporter, but if you keep the fluid in for a long period of time, these small solutes will start getting reabsorbed into the body and the clearance of small solutes will fall if your fluid is in the abdomen for a period of more than four to five hours. So clearance again depends on the drainage volume because the drainage volume comes down, the clearance will also come down. So although high transporters have good solute clearance as compared to low transporters, but if the dwell time is kept prolonged, in high transporters again, the solute clearance will come down because of the ultrafiltration becoming less. So remember, if you have a patient with high transport characteristic, to achieve a good solute clearance and also a reasonable amount of ultrafiltration, the dwell time will have to be kept less. A guide on to estimation of D by P creatine based on the drain volume. If your drain volume using a 2.5% glucose solution at the end of four hours is just 2100, that is you put in two liters, you're getting just 100 ml extra, then it is a high transporter. But on the other hand, if you get very good ultrafiltration in excess of 2700, it's a low transporter. Anything between 21 to 23 is high average and 23 to 2700 could suggest that this patient is having a low average. So again, you can have a rough estimate on the peritoneal membrane characteristic based on the ultrafiltration volume. Now the first step is generally done, as I mentioned earlier, the, between four to six weeks after starting PD. And the ISPD suggests that you must repeat the PET every year. You should also repeat the PET of, if a patient has had peritonitis, but only after the peritonitis has resolved, <coughs> preferably four weeks or eight weeks after resolution of the peritonitis. Because sometimes peritonitis can set in changes which can be permanent. And it can also lead to early detection of say changes like neovascularization or sclerosis. And this test will help you to modify your prescription that this patient is on. Now there is something known as a modified or a rapid PET test, where you use instead of 2.5% bag, you're using a 4.25% dextro solution and a two liter volume. You do a four hour exchange. The patient is upright during the dwell time. You have a pre-test exchange of eight to 10 hours like you do in the standard PET. And you take the dialysis samples <coughs> at zero, one, two, and four hour for creatine, glucose, and sodium. And you also measure the mid-test serum sample for creatine, glucose, and sodium. And if you have an ultrafiltration volume of an excess of 400 ml, this is adequate. A D by P creatine, if it is more than 0.8, then it's considered as fast or rapid transporters. Less than 0.6 is slow transporters. And a sodium sieving, which we'll talk about later, in excess of five millimoles per liter is adequate. Less than five millimoles per liter is inadequate. Now, what is this concept of sodium sealing? Now, initially, this aquaporins, they mediated ultrafiltration uh, due to hypertonic solution, and the fluid that used to come out was free of sodium. So you had free water transport. And this dialysate sodium, it was seen, would fall in the initial one hour because there was little diffusion of the sodium from the small pores. So you, not, you measure this dip of the dialysate to plasma sodium at the end of one hour. And we'll see that normally the dip would be something, in, if you're using a 4.25% bag, would be in excess of five millimoles per liter. So anything less than five millimoles per liter indicates 
there's reduced free water clearance from the aquapolins. There is poor res ultrafiltration response to increasing osmolality of the fluids. If you use a stronger bag, the higher concentration bag, if you have a sodium sieving of less than five millimoles per liter, then it would suggest that you will get poor ultrafiltration even if you use a higher tonicity bag. It indicates impending peritoneal exhaustion. There may be in such patients a better response with icodextrin, and these patients obviously are likely to get into fluid overload. So therefore, you need to keep them in close surveillance. So based on the baseline PET, if you have a high transporter where B by P creatine is more than, as I mentioned earlier, by 0.81, these are about 16% of the total patients. Majority of the patients are either high average or low average, and about roughly 16% are in the low transporter characteristic. So if you have, you, once you have this peritoneal equation test, if you have a patient who is a high transporter, he can be offered either a nocturnal intermittent peritoneal dialysis or a day ambulatory peritoneal dialysis or a CIPD form of dialysis. If you have a high average, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> then they can be used any of these. You can do the conventional CIPD, CCPD, and IPD or a tidal peritoneal dialysis. If you have a low average transporter, and if your renal clearance is less than 2 ml per minute, then you can offer them either CAPD or CCPD. But if the renal clearance is more than 2 ml, you can offer them high dose CAPD. If you have a low transporter and the body surface area is less than 2 meters squared, they can still go on CAPD with the higher dose. But those whose body surface area is in excess of 2 square meters, they may not be fit or suitable for doing peritoneal dialysis. Now, what should be the KTOV? So we have uh, this very famous study from Hong Kong, which was done by YK Lo and colleagues. And they looked at what would be the ideal KTOV that would be desirable in patients on peritoneal dialysis. So there are three groups of patients about 100 in each group. And this was a randomized control trial with a 10 year follow up, which is a fairly long follow up. And they had one group whose KTOV was less than 1.7. There was another group whose KTOV was between 1.7 and 2. And a third group where the KTOV was in excess of 2. So what they found that they, when they compared patients whose KTOV was between 1.7 to 2, and those with greater than two, there was no difference in the survival of the patients. But on the other hand, if they found that the KTOE in patients who had a less than 1.7, as compared to those who were between 1.7 to two, those with less than 1.7 had a much inferior patient survival. So based on their findings, they recommended that the minimum target should be at least 1.7 per week. And this is what they showed, that in those whose KTOV was less than 1.7, their survival was poorer as compared to those between 1.7 to 2. But those who had 1.8 or above, their survival was almost identical. So they suggested that a KTOV, the minimum KTOV that you require in patients with peritoneal dialysis is at least 1.7. So the ISPD guideline in 2006 suggested that the total KTOV is 1.7 and a creatine clearance about 50 liters per week. Now then the question becomes, what should be the exchange volume? Does it vary or can we go with the same exchange volume for all patients? Anybody? Would anybody like to answer? Hello, sir. Yes. Yes, sir, it varies. It, okay. it depends on the body size, actually, the body surface area. Mm -hmm. Very good. So this was a study, which is a very old study, which is published way back in 1994 by Carl Lolf 
and colleagues from again from the University of Missouri, and they looked at the body surface, uh, the weight of the individuals, and they looked at KTV 1.7. So this showed that if an individual is about 60 or 65 kg in weight, you can have a KTOV using a two liter bag, a two liter dwell volume. But those say, suppose say close to almost 80 kg, you needed almost 2.5 liter bags dwell volume to achieve a KTOV of 1.7. But anybody in excess of say 90 kilos and above, they needed a dwell volume of almost three liters. So if you have an individual who has a large body surface area, whose, whose weight is higher or more, then obviously your dwell volume has to increase to achieve a KTOV of 1.7. So this patient, because of financial reasons, although he was 100 kilos in weight, we put him on three exchanges day, we put him on standard volume two liters, we didn't have those days, larger volume bags. We used concentration of 2.5%. He was having an ultrafiltration of 1000 ml and his urine output was 500. Generally, uh, it is recommended that use the lowest glucose concentration of PD fluid whenever there is no evidence of fluid overload. And you must insist, you must tell your patient about compliance to fluid and salt this is extremely important. The salt intake has to be restricted and the patients have to be told about restricting their fluid. This restriction of fluid and sodium or salt intake is much more in patients on hemodialysis as compared to those on peritoneal dialysis. But even on patients on PD, you have to ask them to restrict their fluid intake and salt intake as well. Now this patient, we showed you what was the initial prescription, he returned back to us after four weeks. And he said that he had gained weight and had become edematous. And his ultrafiltration volume, which I told you earlier was about 1000 ml, had become 450 ml. And he was having poor appetite. So what should we do? Pack test. Should, we should do a pack test. Sir, uh, increase exchange volume. Okay. Very good. The PET test to know his transport characteristics and accordingly change the prescription. Okay. The first uh, clinical examination and the assessment so, of the PD catheter. Excellent. So, so you must determine medical. if this is a true ultrafiltration failure. You can rule out whether the patient is constipated. As you mentioned, that you must see for the position of the catheter, you can get an X-ray of the K of X-ray KUB and see whether the catheter is in the true pelvis or not. Rule out leaks. The patient can be having a loss of ultrafiltration. The fluid is getting into the pleural space or into the anterior abdominal wall or into the genital area. Check for blood sugars. He's a diabetic. It's possible that his sugars are uncontrolled, and if you have high blood sugars, you will be getting a low, lower ultrafiltration. And then ultimately check, as you mentioned, the membrane characteristics. So what we did was that since he was a high transporter, which I mean, therefore he would have poor ultrafiltration, we put him on two exchange of 2.5%. One, we used a hypertonic bag of 4 And we kept him dry. And his ultrafiltration improved to about 1200. But after two months, this UF dropped. And his blood sugar we found became very high because of the 4.25% bag. So, how do you control blood sugar in diet? What is it? Control sugar. Anybody can tell us how to control sugars in a diabetic patient? So, uh, sir, uh, this patient should be treated with uh, insulin, and uh, insulin can be given subcutaneously or through the intraperitoneal routes. Uh, as the patient is already having high concentration of uh, glucose, so blood sugar should be checked uh, uh, by the uh, from the serum. 
not by the uh, stick flip, uh, by doing the stick flip. Uh -huh. Very good. So the various methods of controlling sugars are either using an intraperitoneal insulin or a subcutaneous insulin or a combination of both IP and sub-Q insulin. Some people have used oral agents, combination of oral agents and insulin, dietary control and diet and oral agents. Now this was a, a rather old study which looked at what is the best way of administering insulin. As someone mentioned that you can give subcutaneous insulin or somebody said intraperitoneal insulin. Now, which is the best way of administering insulin? Should we give it subcutaneously that we give it in other individuals or should we give it intraperitoneally? What would be a better way? And what they found was that patients who were administered, you can see this blue is patients with were well, subcutaneous, gray is the ones who receive intraperitoneal and this dark blue is the ones who received who were in hemodialysis and received subcutaneous insulin. And they found that the best levels of sugar were achieved in CAPD patients who were receiving intraperitoneal insulin. Now, why is that so? Why is intraperitoneal insulin the best way of they achieve the best results in CAPD patients? Anybody? That intraperitoneal insulin uh, that bypasses the enterohepatic circulations so that uh, readily gets into the blood and uh, we can achieve a high, higher concentration by giving more dose of uh, insulin through intraperitoneal route. Okay. Now this intraperitoneal insulin is absorbed through this peritoneal membrane. It, in, it, it enters into the liver, into the hepatic circulation, and therefore the control is much better as compared to sub insulin. But any side effects, any problems if you administer intraperitoneal insulin? That can, uh, that can cause the inflammation, infection. inflammation of the peritoneum. Mm -hmm. So high dose will be required. Okay, very good. What else? Increased incidence of peritonitis, sir. Okay. So hepatic steatosis, chances of hepatic steatosis. Excellent. So. Okay. One of them said that you require higher dose. The yes, amount sir. of insulin required yeah. if you administer intraperitoneally is almost two to three times that which you require when administering insulin subcutaneously. That's number one. Number two is that you might introduce infection if you don't train your patient properly. So the peritonitis rates may be higher theoretically, and in in our own experience, we found that peritonitis rates do go up. And number three is that you can cause hepatic steatosis in the long run. So that is the other worrying concern with intraperitoneal insulin. But intraperitoneal insulin is more physiological as compared to giving it subcutaneously. So this patient, we, as we controlled his blood sugar, his ultrafiltration improved, his edema came down, but after three months on peritoneal dialysis, he remained anorexic and he had again an increase in swelling of his body and his weight had increased. His, he had pruritus, his serum creatinine was 9.8 and his hemoglobin was about 8 gram per cent. What should we do? What should we do? He's come back to you, it's three months on PDA, sugars are well controlled, but he says that Dr. Saba, I'm feeling I have no appetite and he's gained weight, he's becoming diabetes and creatinine is close to 10. Sir, we'll check the uh, peritoneal clearance. Possibly he's not achieving the adequate amount of uh, uh, creatinine clearance, which would be less than 53 uh, 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 liters per week because he's got large body size area, maybe muscle, large muscle mass also. So maybe right. we need to increase the number of exchanges so that the effluent volume increases, sir. Excellent. So again, you can look at your peritoneal equilibration test because this will give you some, you can try to find out what are the causes. So it helps you to look at the, of course, as I said, the membrane transport classification. It predicts the dialysis dose. It can help you choose the type of regime that you would offer for your patient. 
You can monitor the peritoneal membrane function. You can diagnose any acute membrane injury. It can diagnose causes of inadequate ultrafiltration. It can help you diagnose causes of inadequate solute clearance. And it estimates the D by P ratio of a solute at a particular time. It helps you in diagnosing early ultrafiltration failure. And it assesses influence of systemic disease or the peritoneal membrane function. So in this patient, we did a PET again, and it was found to be high transporter. So what should we do? And what are the problems that you would have in a patient who are high transporter? Anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Patients with high transporters, uh, they, uh, their ultrafiltration is low because they achieve it very early. So if very we good. keep... If we keep the uh, dwell volume for a longer time, uh, as you have already uh, shown us by the graph, uh, later on the ultrafiltration volume drops and along with that the clearance also drops. Very good. Excellent. Best way is to uh, do APD for this patient. Uh -huh. So as, I, as, you, as you mentioned that if you have a high transporter, it's an effective membrane as I told you earlier. It transports solutes quickly. There, but there is a rapid absorption of glucose. And these patients have difficulty in achieving adequate ultrafiltration. And they are at a risk for low serum albumin. So many of these patients can lose a large amount of protein in the dialysis and ultimately have low serum albumin, which may lead to sometimes malnutrition. High average is an effective membrane. It transports solutes well. There's moderate ultrafiltration. Low trans, low uh, patients with low transport characteristics. It's an effective membrane. It's difficult to obtain adequate creatinine clearance without in patients, particularly who do not have restrictive function. But these patients ultrafilter well. And Wu and colleagues way back in 1996, and which has been now shown by other people in subsequent publications, that patients who have high transporters, they have high dropout. They can have low survival and their mortality due to cardiovascular causes increase because they are little edema the volume overloaded. And even the Kedusa study had shown that there was a lower two-year survival in patients with high membrane, high transport characteristics. So what do we do? As someone suggested, APD, that you can shorten the dwell time. You can have more frequent exchanges. You can have day APD with empty abdomen over the night. You can do nocturnal intermittent peritoneal dialysis, and you can do CCPD with more frequent exchanges in nighttime or daytime. You can use bags with higher concentration, glucose concentrations. If you're using 1.5% bags, you can go up to 2.5 or a 4.25. And you can use icodextrin-based solutions if it's available and your patient can afford it. And in countries like ours, we can try and if the patient has residual renal function, we can use loop diuretics to increase the urine output and, of course, try to avoid hyper, more hypertonic solution. So patients can be given diuretics. And would you know how much diuretics can be used in these patients, the dose of diuretics? Anybody? If you were to prescribe, a, say, a frusamide, how much would you give these patients? Up to 400 mg, sir. Okay, very good. So some people have given as high as 250 and occasionally people have suggested 500, but 250 milligrams of prusamide can be given to try and achieve as much of diuresis as possible, provided the patient already has a pre-existing restroom function. The other things that can be done is either you can increase the number of exchanges or you can increase the fill volume. Now, which one do you think will be better? Increasing the number of exchanges or increasing the fill volume? So, in his case, both fill, need fill to be volume. done because, uh, because sir, he is go he's a large uh, surfaced area. Uh, giving a la increasing the fill volume will uh, in recruit more membranes, so achieve more uh, ultrafiltration, sir. And number of exchanges uh, also will help because uh, uh, he's a high transporter area. I suppose you didn't. I mean. Uh, you had to choose between one, uh, one between the, amongst the two, the number of exchanges and the increasing the fill volume. Which one would you prefer to choose? Sir, then sir, the increase of exchanges, volume. sir. Fill volume, sir. 
नहीं नहीं फ्रीक्वेंसी नंबर ऑफ एक्सचेंजेस इंक्रीज द नंबर ऑफ एक्सचेंजेस सर इन दिस केस इफ चूज इफ डिसाइडेड आस्क टू चूज वन फ्रीक्वेंसी सर इंक्रीज द नंबर ऑफ एक्सचेंजेस एंड समबडी एल्स सेड इंक्रीज द फिल वॉल्यूम एक्सचेंजेस ओके सो इट्स सीन दैट in general both an increase in the frequency and the number of exchanges will increase both the clearance and ultimate ratio but increasing the fill volume as is more effective in improving the clearance than an increase in the number of exchanges so as sudeep mentioned initially he was first asking for increasing the fill volume but then he changed later to saying the increase in exchanges so if you increase the volume of your exchange you would have a better clearance as compared to increasing the number of exchanges so maximize the fill volumes in each exchange before you increase the number of exchanges so you can go up from 2 to 2 and a half or if you have a 3 liter bag available you can go up to 3 liters and then you can consider increasing the number of exchanges and the patient size is not an indicator for tol of tolerance to a larger fill volume it is seen that individuals above the weight of 60 can easily tolerate 2.5 days provided they're not told about it sometimes they have this psychological barrier that if i how can i accommodate 2.5 liters of fluid in my abdomen but if you don't tell them that you're giving 2.5 liters they will not be able to make out the difference and this was an interesting publication that was made in 2004 where they showed that patients by increasing the dwell volume the fill volume they were able to reduce the incidence of fatigue anorexia insomnia nausea and pruritus this came down of course the urine output came down because of the larger volumes and large and more dialysis that you were giving but they were able to reduce the symptoms by increasing the dwell volume so we then increased the dwell volume to 2.5 liters and we were still doing three exchanges with night being tried in this patient we did a adequacy test and we found that his weekly ktoe was 1.35 his weekly creatinine clearance was 45 liters and we modified his prescription and increased the number of exchanges to four times per day three during the day that he was doing and we added one more exchange at night of 2.5% his creatinine improved because of the number of exchanges we increased we had increased the volume uh, the dwell volume also earlier to that but again unfortunately the patient started getting edematous so by that time icodextrin was available in india and we decided to put him on icodextrin at night now what are the advantages of using icodextrin anybody sir it increases the ultrafiltration volume it can okay. be kept for a longer dwell or okay. we can use it in the overnight dwell and uh, uh, metabolic effects so yeah. glucose related uh, adverse effects uh, yes yes yeah. uh, there is there is no glucose related direct adverse effects preserves the membrane so uh, how many exchanges of icodextrin can you use can you one. Use one exchange sir. two exchanges one exchange one, sir. one, one. exchange sir. why not for the exchange because of cost constraints sir and if the cost was not a factor time so the accumulation of maltose sir. will be there okay so what will happen if this maltose so the glucose monitoring method by capillary glucose monitoring it will show false high no that's okay so how does it i mean is there a major side effect maltose this glucose being higher you can use Or is there anything else that maltose gets converted and there can be a cardiac depressant? Okay, icodextrin, as you mentioned, most of you did that. It provides better ultrafiltration. There is better clearance, better metabolic profile, and patients on icodextrin have been shown to have a better weight control and their technique survival also improves. but how long should icodextrin be kept in the abdomen what is the, any anybody knows that what is the minimum time that we should try and keep icodextrin 
So six minimum to seven hours, sir, minimum, to get maximum minimum, uh, uh, ultra filtration. Eight hours. Minimum eight hours. The graph is in front of you. You can look at it and tell me if the answer. So at least ten to twelve hours. Sir. Now, if you look at this graph, you can see that this shows you the clearance with each ultra filtration with each of these bags. One point five percent. You can see that it starts dropping after four hours. 2.5% by about 6 hours, 4.25% by about 8 hours or so. And on the other hand, if you look at icodextrin, it continues to increase beyond even 12 hours. So the, if you have to achieve good ultrafiltration with icodextrin, then you must keep it in 12 for at least 10 to 12 hours. If you keep it less than 10 hours, then there's no point in using icodextrin. Icodextrin is expensive. And you can achieve the same amount of ultrafiltration using a 4.25% if you keep the dwell time of less than 10 hours. So whenever you're using icodextrin, remember that at least keep the dwell time between 10 to 12 hours or more to achieve the maximum ultrafiltration, okay? Now the patient was we kept on icodextrin, remained stable for the next two years. His edema became less, his appetite improved, there was improvement in nutrition and he was working. Again started developing uremic symptoms. And his urine output had started dropping over the past two years. We added diuretics in high dose, but there was no response. We advised him more fluid and salt restriction, but he was not very compliant. And there was further drop in urine output and he became aneuric. And the question is, can this patient who is aneuric continue on peritoneal dialysis? Anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can, yes, sir. If, yes, sir. If we can switch the patient to uh, APD. So what is the evidence which studies are there in literature which shows that aneuric patients can do reasonably well on PDI? Are there any caveats that we have to keep in mind? Anyone? So the UF should be at least more than uh, a liter. If the ultrafiltration is less than one liter, the aneuric patient uh, won't do that well, sir. Okay, very good. So there was this uh, famous study called the NECOSART study, which looked at the aneuric patients. And what they showed was that patients whose ultrafiltration was in excess of 750 ml would have a better survival as compared to those whose ultrafiltration was less than 7. So if you have an aneuric patient, you have to ensure that if your ultrafiltration is at least greater than 750 ml, then survivals are better. But if your, if your ultrafiltration is less than that, then you will have a very poor survival in these patients. So they found that there was increased association with death with the creatinine ATO urea was less than 1.5 and the creatinine tears were less than 40 liters per week. And there was improvement if there was ultrafiltration more than 750 ml. It was, it was, it was higher mortality was less than 750 ml. And therefore this study said that if you have this situation where your KTOV is more than 1.7, your creatinine clearance is more than 50 liters, your ultrafiltration is greater than 750 ml, you can still continue these patients on CAPD. And again, they showed that patient, aneuric patients, they looked at patient survival was about 67%. At two years, the technique survival was 73% at two years. And when they confined the patient and technique survival, this was about 50% at two years. This was in aneuric patients. So this patient, he was aneuric. We continued CAPD4 exchanges, 2.5%, three bags, 2.5 liters each, 7.5%, two liter, one bag at night. Uh, his appetite deteriorated, he was unable to walk without support. He became, started having dyspnea on exertion and his weight gain was tremendous. He gained almost 30 kg of weight, went up from 105 to almost 135 kg. 
he was advised to shift over to hemodialysis he was reluctant to leave peritoneal dialysis so with great persuasion we started on hemodialysis uh, once a week in addition to four exchanges of peritoneal dialysis so let us talk about ultrafiltration failure anybody tell me what are the causes of reduced ultrafiltration sir this can be change in the peritoneal membrane okay this can be because of the uh, uh, patient is not adhered to the uh, fluid and sodium restriction if this can be uh, uh, related to the uh, pd uh, that can be because of the mechanical problem like patient is chronic these constipated. have to be ruled out to cause it a true ultrafiltration failure the ultrafiltration yeah. failures are could be of two are of two types a type 1 and type 2 in type 1 which typically happens in a case of peritonitis episodes where the uh, uh, patient turns into high transporter and uh, longer dwells lead to reduction in ultrafiltration and type 2 ultrafiltration failure uh, results because of peritoneal fibrosis uh, this happens generally in patients who are, have been on a long duration for pd and has have had recurrent episodes of peritonitis okay good sorry, sorry for so, ultrafiltration failure can be of four types so we'll so the causes for reduced ultrafiltration could be non compliance as somebody is drinking large amounts of water taking a lot of salt not doing the dialysis following your dialysis prescription not doing the same number of dialysis that number of exchanges that you advised he is doing less than number of exchanges so he can have reduced ultrafiltration there's excess salt and water intake there could be incorrect choice of the dialysis tonicity that is if you have told him to take 2.5% bags he is taking only 1.5% bags so you will have poor ultrafiltration the loss of urine output the patient may have been having urine output initially but now the urine output has become nil there could be some mechanical causes like migration of the catheter the catheter could have become blocked there could be leakage of the fluid into either the pleural cavity or in the abdominal wall or in the genital area patient's sugar levels may be uncontrolled which can cause again poor ultrafiltration and there could be a true ultrafiltration failure so you need to look and evaluate for reversible causes and evaluation of the peritoneal membrane function so as i said look for dietary indiscretion or in non compliance so therefore maybe this may be because of deficient education it could be because the prescription that you have given may be very complex and he's not able to follow it or he's totally burned out tired and he's not doing the pd adequately then you look at mechanical problems like leaks obstruction entrapment or malabsorption malposition of the catheter and then you try and see whether your prescription is appropriate whether he's keeping the fluid in for the adequate time whether the fluid is being kept Uh, if he is a high transporter and he is keeping the fluid for long periods of time, then obviously ultrafiltration will become poorer. If he is using a dialysate bag of lower tonicity than what you have prescribed, again you will get poor ultrafiltration. So you can do a modified PET using a 4.25 percent and keep it for four hours. And at the end of four hours, if your UF is in excess. of 400 ml that means you put in 2 liters you're getting 2400 ml out this means that this patient is either not following instructions his metal membrane is intact but he is not following instructions he is taking too much of water taking salt is doing less amount of dialysis so you have to go back and evaluate him clinically however <coughs> if your ultrafiltration volume is less than 400 that is if you put in 2 liters you're getting less than 2400 out then you have to do a small solute profile and the incidence of ultrafiltration failure at the end of one year is roughly about 3% at 3 years about 10% and at about 6 years is as high as 30% now what is the definition of ultrafiltration failure it means there's increasing requirement of high osmolality dialysate fluid that is you are requiring three or more 4.25% glucose exchanges to maintain the patient to be free of edema and to achieve his target weight and is also defined as a net ultrafiltration of less than 400 ml in 4 hours using a 4.25% glucose dialysate 
Now, what is happens to the peritoneal membrane after long-term peritoneal dialysis? There is reduplication of the mesothelial and the endothelial basement membrane, increased synthesis and deposition of the matrix proteins with sub, within the submesothelium. There is progressive subendothelial hyalinization. There is narrowing and obliteration of the vascular lumen. And peritoneal fibrosis has been detected almost half to three quarters of the patients within one to two years. And this can ultimately lead to something known as encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis, that is peritoneal membrane thickening, sclerosis, calcification, and encapsulation of the bowel loops. So when you look at this, this is, say, the submesothelial compact zone, which is uh, this has there's an intact mesothelial layer over the submesothelial zone, which the submesothelial zone has uh, few blood vessels, few scattered cells. But when the patient has been on peritoneal dialysis for some length of time, for some years, then you can see that there is this submesothelial compact zone is thickened. The mesothelial cell layer is almost denuded. And you find that a large number of activated fibroblasts and angiogenesis within this submesothelial compact zone. So this peritoneal membrane has thickened. And if you look at the histomorphological changes, if this is at the beginning of PD, and six years after start of PD, you can see, sorry, you can see there's increased number of vessels in this area. There is some mesothelial fibrosis and there's vasculopathy. So this, why does it happen? This is because of continuous exposure to bio incompatible PD fluids, which can lead to ultrafiltration failure. And this high glucose loads and the glucose degradation products in the conventional PD fluids causes peritoneal membrane inflammation, which can lead to fibrosis and neovascularization and ultrafiltration failure. Now, what are the functional consequences of this inflammation that occurs? This ultrafiltration failure occurs because there's increased in number of As I said, there's increase in the new vas neovascularization. And because of new vascularization, there's increase in number of pores in the peritoneal membrane. Now, when there's increase in number of pores, what happens? There is an acceleration, the small solute transport, and therefore there's a more rapid dissipation of the osmotic gradient. And this osmotic gradient is important for the ultrafiltration to take this. So when there's loss of this osmotic gradient, because of the increased number of pores in the peritoneal membrane, there'll be loss of ultrafiltration. So reduction in the ultrafiltration occurs because of peritonitis, frequent episodes, systemic inflammation, bioincompatible PD solutions, which can lead to local PD peritoneal inflammation. This can lead to high peritoneal transport, when there's high peritone transport, there's increased glucose absorption, there's decrease in the osmotic gradient, reduction in the ultrafiltration. When I, there's a reduction of the ultrafiltration, you tend to use more hypertonic solutions, which can again lead to further injury of the peritoneal membrane because of higher concentration of higher amounts of glucose that is there in the fluid. So this is a vicious cycle. So once this cycle starts, this continues. So the other cause of inflammation is uremia, the stress of the peritoneum due to formation of other carbonyl products. This can accelerate the formation of advanced glycation and products that induces upper equation of rage. The, the PD catheter itself can induce inflammatory reaction and can be a site for bacterial biofilm formation. The dialysis solution, as I mentioned, is associated with increased peritoneal inflammation because of low pH presence of lactate, <coughs> excuse me, hyperosmolarity, increased glucose concentration, and the formation of glucose degradation products, and advanced glycation influx, and certain icodextrin metabolites can also increase the peritoneal inflammation. So you look at the small solute profile. If you find that the patient has a low transfer, the D by P creatinine of less than 0.5, it suggests there's disruption of the peritoneal space. If you have high transport when the D by P creatine in a patient who has low ultrafiltration, if it's more than 0.81, it shows that there's it's either an inherently high transporter 
who's had recent peritonitis or has been in long-term PD. And if the transport carries in between, that is between, it's either a high average or a low average, then it could be either a mechanical blockage or enhanced reabsorption or acoporin deficiency. So somebody mentioned there are two types and someone else said there are four types. So actually there are four types of ultrafiltration failure. Type one is when you have low ultrafiltration with high solute transport, that is D by T creatine, more than 0.8. Now this can occur because of increased peritoneal membrane functional surface being available because this may occur because of new angiogenesis, recurrent peritonitis, because the patient has been on long-term on peritoneal dialysis. Now these patients are prone to higher mortality and do not do very well in the long run. So it's the most common type of ultrafiltration failure. There's rapid loss of osmotic gradient due to absorption of glucose. The hallmark is a new onset dialysate by plasma creatine of greater than 0.81. And it develops after, say, three years or more of staying on peritoneal dialysis. And the mechanism is increase in the effective surface area, secondary to increase in the vascularity. Now, how do you manage such patients? You can give them low drain. Uh, you can use icodextrin. You can have shortening of the dwell time using automated nightly per, uh, uh, automated peritoneal dialysis during nightly peritoneal dialysis. You can use high glucose concentration dialysate, but this would not be a very good option because you will again worsen the membrane. Or you could shift these patients to hemodialysis. Some people have attempted in stopping PD for a period of four weeks because they said that this may improve the outcome by, of these patients by resting the peritoneal membrane. And in these, some of these patients, they found that they could improve in the ultrafiltration. Uh, but again, it's not a very good option in majority of the patients. What is type two ultrafiltration failure? you have low ultrafiltration, but a low solute transport, that a D by P creatine of less than 0.5. So your F is low, but your D by P creatine is less than 0.5. And what does it suggest? This suggests that the patient has peritoneal sclerosis, you may have multiple additions, and it can lead to sclerosing encapsulating peritonitis. And this is seen in less than 1% of the patients on PD. So there's decrease in the solute clearance and ultrafiltration because secondary to reduced effective surface area. The pathology, as I mentioned earlier, is related to scarring and additions after severe peritonitis and under intra-abdominal complications. And essentially is caused by TGF beta because it leads to epithelial uh, mesenchymal transition, some mesothelial fibrosis and obliterative vascular pathology. And the most severe varieties of type 2 ultrafiltration failure can lead to something known as encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis, where patients present with symptoms of bowel obstruction with extensive adhesions by hypertrophied and calcified peritoneum. And it can be seen after almost 8 to 10 years on patients staying on PD. And this is what the gross pathologic findings of EPS, where you have peritoneal thickening, you have peritoneal inflammatory changes, you have the uh, peritoneal calcification, which is present in this. And many of these patients, most of these patients, unfortunately, do not survive. So what could be the treatment? You can either have adjunctive hemodialysis or a permanent transfer to hemodialysis. You can try high-dose loop diuretics in patients who have restoral functions. Patients who develop EPS, some people have suggested and tried immunosuppressants such as steroids, azathioprine, microphenolate, morphotil, or CNIs. Demoxifen has been found to be beneficial in some studies. And in severe forms of EPS, uh, people have tried surgical enteroplysis, but this is associated with high mortality risk. Now, there are two other types of ultrafiltration. One is type 3 and type 4 where you have a low drain volume and the patient may have a high or a low average transport characteristics. 
Now, this could either be because of a mechanical problem and which you might have ruled out in each hill worker. The type three type of ultrafiltration failure is because of increased lymphatic or tissue reabsorption. And this can be assessed by disappearance of macromolecules like albumin dextrin for the peritoneal cavity, we'll talk about it later. And type four type of ultrafiltration failure is because of acaporin deficiency. And this is assessed by the blunting of the D by P or sodium sieving that we had talked earlier. So in type three, there is peritoneal lymphoangiogenesis and is diagnosed by the rate of reabsorption of dextran 70 or radio labeled albumin from the peritoneal cavity. And you will find that you should suspect type three ultrafiltration failure when you fail to achieve the desired ultrafiltration with icodextrin. So if you're using icodextrin, normally you would have a good ultrafiltration. That is what we normally see. But if your patient who has been on using icodextrin suddenly find that the ultrafiltration has come down significantly and there's no mechanical obstruction, then this may suggest to you that there could be a type three ultrafiltration failure because icodextrin is reabsorbed through the lymphatics. And because of lymphoangiogenesis, more icodextrin rapidly reabsorbed and as a result of this, the ultrafiltration would drop. These patients with type three ultrafiltration failure will have a poor fibrosis and may need to be shifted to hemodialysis permanently. The type four ultrafiltration failure is due to acaporin deficiency. And it has been seen in patients who have been on PD for more than four years. Now this aquaporin, as we told you earlier, it transports only water and not sodium. So there's sodium sieving. Now, what is sodium sieving when we talked about earlier that you will see that if you use a 4.25% bag, then you will find a drop of sodium in the initial first hour of about five to 10 millimole. But if you find that there is no drop of the sodium levels, at the end of one hour, using a 4.25% bag, that the drop in sodium is less than five millimoles per liter, this suggests that there could be an acaporin deficiency. And this could lead to something known as type four type of ultrafiltration failure. So when you have this type three or type four, what, what can you do? You can reduce your salt and water intake. You can give diuretics if it helps, shorten the dwell time, you can use bethanacol. And if you have a type four type of ultrafiltration where you have aquaporin type of thing, you can use icodestrin because that's been shown that you can increase the ultrafiltration by using non aquaporin channels. So in the end, I'll suggest that when you have well, the, uh, you can do a peritoneal equivalent test in a patient with ultrafiltration failure, if you have Low solute clearance, you have a type two membrane failure, peritoneal fibrosis. Your high solute ratio with ultrafiltration, true ultrafiltration failure, it can be because of type one membrane failure. And if you find there is unchanged solute ratio and you have a poor drain volume, this could be because of catheter malfunction, leakage of diacid, or it could be because of type three or type four ultrafiltration failure. So this is what this patient looked like. He had been on peritoneal dialysis for a good number of years. He had unfortunately uh, developed uh, ultrafiltration failure, and then we had to switch him onto hemodialysis. Okay, thank you very much for attending. I hope you've been able to learn something about ultrafiltration failure and PD prescription. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, folks. So we'll, uh, if there are any questions, you can ask me if you wish to, but uh, or if you want to sort of ask questions later, then you can do Sir, one question. If the patient, uh, uh, as uh, you have uh, uh, the patient has uh, some ultrafiltration, oh, 
failure. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Sir, uh, sir uh, if we... I have one uh, question. Hello. Sir, I have one question. In some uh, some books, this has been mentioned that type uh, one uh, ultrafiltration failure is same as that you have mentioned. The type two is because of the aquaporin defect. The type three is uh, that is because of the low uh, uh, transporters, uh, and the type four is because of the lymphatic ab ab uh, absorption of the peritoneal fluid, uh, which actually we should uh, mention in our exam. So type one type as is what uh, type two I told you is because of uh, this peritoneal sclerosis. Type three is because of increased lymphatic reabsorption, and type four is aquaporin uh, deficiency. Sir, I have one question. Hello. Yeah. Sir, if we have to choose between increasing the concentration uh, of the fluid uh, bag versus increasing the number of frequency, which should be uh, and done first no you can because see you must remember that increasing the frequency is actually in unfortunately in our country most patients are dependent on somebody else to do their dialysis and uh, so increasing the number of exchanges beyond a certain number may be difficult for the family member to carry out so i would increase the the concentration of the bag uh, and see whether you can achieve the desired results. If, however, you feel that this patient is a high transporter, where even increasing the concentration of bag may not give you the desired results because if your dwell time is too long, you will artificial remains poor. In such patients, you may reduce the dwell time and increase the number of exchanges. Okay. So it will essentially depend on the peritoneal membrane characteristic. With a high transporter, Perhaps increasing the number of exchanges or shortening the del 12 time will help. Otherwise, you can increase the concentration of the bag and see. Thank you, sir. Thank so, you. Sir, what is the exact timing to give insulin intraperitoneal? Uh, sorry? What is the exact timing and method to give insulin in patients who are on PD? Why it can be administered with your exchange, with the bags. So, so it has to mix along in the back solution or it has to be given separately and then you have to flush. No, no, no. You administer it into the PD fluid in the bag. There okay. is, you see the PD fluid bag has a port for, in, for administering medications. So you clean that port and then you add the insulin to it. And you have to shake the bag so that the insulin gets mixed up with the entire amount of fluid. So it doesn't have to be, it cannot be given separately. It has to be given along with the PD fluid. So you can time your exchanges in such a way so that it reasonably matches meal times. Okay. Sir, is it same for the uh, erythropoietin which is being given uh, intraperitoneally sometimes? No, erythropoietin we are not giving intraperitoneally. Sir? Uh, for some patients, uh, average size patient, they have they used to complain with the dwell volume of two liters also. So, sir, uh, is there anything like that? Ki we can reduce at least this much should be the volume for this patient if they could not tolerate two liters. I think have... less than two liters is not really good enough. You see, initial when the when you are sort of starting your PD. Sometimes some patients may complain of burning sensation when the fluid goes into the abdomen. Now this happens because sometimes uh, you know the fluid has this jet effect. And if it runs, into, it hits the fluid coming out of the catheter may be striking one of the bowel loops, and that may produce pain. The second thing could be because it may be this acidic fluid; it can cause some burning sensation. So early on, people who suggested that you can add some soda bicarb into the peritoneal fluid bag. But that is not a good, <coughs> uh, good option because you may introduce peritonitis. 
And third is that you can slow the speed at which the fluid enters into the abdomen. So you can just <clears throat> compress the inflow tube. So the speed at which the fluid runs in can be slowed down and that can reduce the pain uh, in, in the, in the, uh, where the fluid is being filled into the abdomen. And fourth, psychologically, some of these patients, they feel that you're putting in fluid in the abdomen. It gives them this feeling that my, there's distension of the abdomen and feeling of pain. So over a period of time, they get used to it. And then some of these patients, when you drain them out, they get this empty abdomen syndrome where because the fluid, they're used to having fluid in the abdomen. And if you make them dry, they have this pain. Uh, so in those situations, you have to keep a certain amount of fluid in the abdominal cavity all the time. Otherwise they get this pain because what's known as empty abdominal syndrome. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Sir, uh, I have one patient. Uh, she's a lady, 65 year old. I, she was on uh, peritoneal dialysis from last six months. Now she has developed hepat I mean, hydrothorax on the right side uh -huh. because of which she was having breathlessness. Uh -huh. So I have uh, shifted her to hemodialysis presently. The PAPD catheter is in C2. There was no ultrafiltration uh, issues as such. She was not uremic. I mean, there was some uremic symptoms. But uh, now with the hemodialysis, she was doing fine. Her x-ray has cleared up. So what will be the next line of management? I mean, can we restart her on uh, peritoneal dialysis in her future course? Why did you, can you just come again? Why did you change over from PD to hemo? So because she was having a right-sided, uh, I mean, uh, uh, hydrothorax, which was not responding okay. even okay. after okay. increasing the... So, yes, sir. So now one needs to be sure whether this is uh, because of uh, this hydrothorax had developed because of leakage of fluid from the peritoneal space into the neural cavity. So that can be done by... Yeah. I had done, uh, I had done, uh, sir, uh, glucose in the, uh, I mean, pleural fluid. So that was on a higher side. So I, I suppose that it was because of the okay. uh, leakage so, from the diaphragmatic. So so some people have done what you have done. That is giving rest for a while. And then again, trying restarting the CAPD. And in some cases, what if there is any rent in the, in between the pleural and the peritoneal cavities, you know, it may have sealed off. Uh, others would try doing uh, uh, injecting some sort of sclerosing agent and trying to cause uh, this rent to sort of get sealed off totally. So people have used in the past alcohol powder, they've used other uh, sclerosing agents. So the only way that you can reconfirm after having stopped PD for some time is by restarting PD and seeing whether there's a, a pure diffusion developing. If there's no pure diffusion developing, it's fine. Go ahead. You can start with small volumes, increase the volume exchanges. And, but if you find that again, you're having a leakage into the pleural space. And if the patient desires to continue on PD, then you have to administer some sclerosing agent to seal it off. Thank you, sir. So thank you so much for uh, uh, patiently listening. And uh, hopefully it was of some help to you. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. The students are really happy with the detailed presentation and your guidance. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Puri, for organizing it. Welcome, sir. Thank you again. Okay.